Hey guys, it's Jay Stephen Roberts from Real Crusades History. I want to talk a little bit tonight about a period in Byzantine history that I think is occasionally overlooked. And that is the period leading up to the Fourth Crusade in 1204. There is this widely held view that the Fourth Crusade, in which an army of crusaders, French and Venetians, sacked and conquered Constantinople, was kind of this event that really shattered the Byzantine Empire. Like before it happened, the Byzantine Empire was still strong and stable, and afterwards it was done. And it, the blame can be laid on the shoulders of the crusaders. However, I do not think the evidence and the historical events that came before the Fourth Crusade support that idea. I'm going to explain why. But first of all, let me just say, I think that the Byzantine Empire, by the time the Fourth Crusade arrives in 1204 and does its damage and does its horrific events to Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire is already pretty much rendered rather defenseless and rather impotent to fight its enemies for a number of reasons. First of all, if we look at the 12th century in general in Byzantine history, it's a positive century for the Byzantine world. Alexius Comnenus is the first emperor. He's a good emperor. He does a lot of good things. After that comes John Comnenus, who is an even better emperor, in my opinion. And then we've got Manuel Comnenus after that. So these three really good emperors in a row who do a lot to improve the position of the Byzantine world. And something happens when Manuel Comnenus dies that changes everything. What happens is Manuel dies and his son is a boy, is, is a small child still, and his wife, Maria, is left in a rather defenseless position. And without a strong personality to guide the empire, well, her reign doesn't last long. Her regency. She's the regent for her son. And her son is overthrown. And a series of very poor emperors come into power who decimate the Byzantine Empire. And to illustrate that, I'm going to read some portions of a book called The Byzantine Empire by Charles Oman. It's one of my favorite books about the Byzantine world, just because it's very succinct and to the point. So I'm just going to read from this book, starting with the death of Manuel Comnenus. In 1180, Manuel died, and with him died the good fortune of the house of Comnenus. His son and heir, Alexius, was a boy of 13, and the inevitable contest for the regency, which always accompanied a minority, ensued. After two troubled years, Andronicus Comnenus, a first cousin of the emperor, Manuel, was proclaimed Caesar and took over the guardianship of the young Alexius. Andronicus was an unscrupulous ruffian whose past life should have been sufficient warning against putting any trust in his professions. He had once attempted to assassinate Manuel and twice deserted to the Turks. But... He was a consummate hypocrite and won his way to the throne by professions of piety and austere virtue. No sooner was he seated by the side of Alexius II and felt himself secure that he seized and strangled his young relative. But like our own Richard III, uh, he says our own, the, the author was British, Andronicus found that the moment of his accession to sole power, was the moment of the commencement of his troubles. Rebels rose in arms all over the empire to avenge the murdered Alexius, and the Normans of Sicily seized the opportunity of invading Macedonia. Conspiracies were rife in the capital, and the executions which followed their detection were so numerous and bloody that a perfect reign of terror set in. So, okay, we've got... This is all the ingredients for a political disaster. You have a boy king who is slain, and we have an idiot and a self-centered 
power hungry fool who takes control. And then what does he start doing? He starts killing people, you know, executing anybody who even remotely frightens him or, or who seems to be a threat to him. The emperor plunged into the most reckless cruelty till men almost began to believe that his mind was affected. Ere long, the end came. An inoffensive nobleman named Isaac Angelus, being accused of treason, was arrested at his own door by the emissaries of the tyrant. Instead of surrendering himself, Isaac drew his sword and cut down the official who laid hands on him. A mob came to his aid and met no immediate opposition, for Andronicus was absent from the capital. The mob swelled into a multitude. The guards would not fight, and when the emperor returned in haste, he was seized and torn to pieces, without a sword, being drawn in his cause. Isaac Angelus reigned in his stead. The state which had been drained of its resources by the energetic but wasteful Manuel. Okay, now Omen is talking about Manuel Comnenus there. Uh, Charles Omen doesn't have a very high opinion of Manuel Comnenus. He thinks that most of his campaigns were rather wasteful and he should have spent more time campaigning in the East. I do agree with, with Omen on that, but let's continue. And disorganized by the rash and wicked Andronicus, now passed into the hands of the two most feeble and despicable creatures who ever sat upon the imperial throne. Did you hear that? This is a rather interesting period for the Byzantine world. Omen is saying that you're about to have the two worst emperors in the history of the empire. And after you hear how they behaved, you're probably not going to disagree. Let's keep reading. The brothers Isaac and Alexius Angelus, whose reigns cover the years 1185 to 1204. It's a crucial period. Among all the periods which we have hitherto described in the tale of the East Roman Empire, that covered by the reign of the two wretched Angeli may be pronounced the most shameful. The peculiar disgrace of the period lies in the fact that the condition of the empire was not hopeless at the time. With ordinary courage and prudence, it might have been held together, for the attacks directed against it were not more formidable than others, which had been beaten off with ease. If the blow had fallen when a hero like Leo III, or even a statesman like Alexius I, was on the throne, there is no reason to doubt that it would have been parried, but it fell in the times of two incompetent triflers who conducted the state on the principle of let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Isaac and Alexius felt in themselves no power of redeeming the empire from the evil day and resignedly fell back on personal enjoyment. Isaac's tastes lay in the direction of gorgeous raiment and the collection of miraculous icons. Alexius preferred the pleasures of the table. Considered as sovereigns, there was little to choose between them. Each was competent to ruin an empire, already verging on its decline. The disaster which the Angeli brought on their realm was rendered possible only by its complete military and financial disorganization. As a military power, the empire had never recovered the effects of the Seljuk invasions, which had robbed it of its great recruiting ground for its native troops in Asia Minor. So Omen's talking about this part of the world that is now Turkey. Anatolia, it's also referred to. This was a crucial part of the Byzantine world that was lost in the 11th century and was never fully recovered. The Kemnenai recovered a lot of it, but it was never fully recovered. After that loss, the use of mercenaries had become more and more prevalent. So again, another problem we see with political entities when they shift from using their own people in the army to mercenaries. The brilliant campaigns of Manuel Comnenus had been made at the head of a soldiery of whom two-thirds were not born subjects of the empire. He, it is true, had kept them within the bounds of strict discipline and contrived at all costs to provide their pay, but the weak and thriftless Angeli 
were able neither to find the money nor to maintain discipline. A state which relies for its defense on foreign mercenaries is ruined if it allows them to grow disorderly and inefficient. In times of stress, they mutiny instead of fighting. The civil administration was in almost as deplorable a condition while those two earthly angels, as a contemporary chronicler called them, were charged with its care. Isaac Angelus put the finishing touch to administrative abuses, which had already been rife enough under the Comneni by exposing offices and posts to auction. Instead of paying his officials, he sent them forth without purse or scrip, like the apostles of old, to make what profit they could by extortion from the from the provincials. You hear that? So at this point, the Byzantine government isn't funding itself through the normal means. They're actually just sending out the officials to collect their own pay through thuggery. In other words, just institutionalized abuse of the citizens. Straight up. That's all it is. His brother Alexius promised on his accession to make all appointments on the ground of merit, but proved in reality as bad as Isaac. He was surrounded by a ring of rapacious favorites who managed all patronage and dispensed it in return for bribes. When high posts were not sold, they were given as gifts to men of local influence whose rebellion was dreaded. The history of the twenty years covered by the reigns of the two Angeli is cut into two equal halves. At the deposition of Isaac by his brother in 1195, it is only necessary to point out how the responsibility for the disasters of the period is to be divided between them. Isaac's share consists in the loss of Bulgaria and Cyprus. The former country had now been in the hands of the Byzantines for nearly 200 years, since its conquest by Basil II. You remember that when Basil II um, cut off all the Bulgarians' hands and put out their eyes when he conquered them. But the Bulgarians had not merged in the general body of the subjects of the empire. They preserved their natural, excuse me, they preserved their national language and customs and never forgot their ancient independence. So that's another feature of the Byzantine Empire at this point is that they have nations within themselves, within, within the empire, that want to be independent and think of themselves as a nation set apart from the Byzantines. In 1187, three brothers named Peter, John, and Ozan stirred up rebellion among them. If firmly treated, it might have been crushed with ease by the regular troops of the empire, but Isaac first appointed incompetent generals who let the rebellion grow to a head, and when at last he placed an able officer... Alexius Branus in command, his lieutenant took the opportunity of using his army for revolt. <laughs> so there you go. Branus marched against Constantinople and would have taken it had not Isaac committed the charge of the troops that remained faithful to him to stronger hands than his own. He bribed an able adventurer from the west, Conrad, Marquis of Montferrat, by the offer of his sister's hand and a great sum of money to become his savior. The gallant Lombard routed the forces of Branus, slew the usurper, and preserved the throne for his brother-in-law. But while the civil war was going on, the Bulgarians were left unchecked and made such head that there was no longer much apparent chance of subduing them. Isaac took the field against them in person, only to see the great town of Nysus, Sophia, and Varna taken before his eyes. While a national revolt deprived the emperor of Bulgaria, Cyprus was lost to a meaner force. Isaac Comnenus, a distant relative of the Emperor Manuel Comnenus, raised rebellion among the Cypriots and defeated the fleet and army, which his namesake of Constantinople sent against him. And of course, this is the Isaac who later gets defeated by Richard the Lionheart. He held out for six years and appeared likely to establish a permanent kingdom in the island. This revolt was of the worst augury to the empire. It had often lost provinces by the invasion of barbarian hordes or the rebellion of subject nationalities. But that a native rebel should sever a civilized Greek province from the empire and reign as emperor of Cyprus was a new phenomenon. By the imperial theory, the idea of an independent empire of Cyprus was wholly monstrous and abnormal. 
the successful rebellion of Isaac Comnenus pointed to the possibility of a general breaking up of the Byzantine dominion into fragments, a danger that had never appeared before. Till now, the provinces had always obeyed the capital, and no instance had been known of a rebel maintaining himself by any other way than the capture of Constantinople. Isaac Comnenus might, however, have founded a dynasty in Cyprus if he had not quarreled with Richard Coeur de Leon, the crusading king of England. When he maltreated some shipwrecked English crews, Richard punished him by landing his army in Cyprus and seizing the whole island. Isaac was thrown into a dungeon, and the English king gave his dominions to Guy of Lusignan, who called in Frank adventurers to settle up the land and made it into a feudal kingdom of the usual western type. While Isaac II was in the midst of his Bulgarian war and misconducting it with his usual fatuity, he was suddenly dethroned by a palace intrigue. His own brother, Alexius Angelus, had hatched a plot against him, which worked so successfully that Isaac was caught, blinded, and immured in a monastery long before his adherents knew that he was in danger. Alexius III never showed any other proof of energy save this skillful coup d'etat aimed at his own brother. Omen's writing is good. <laughs> he continued the Bulgarian war with the same ill success that had attended Isaac's dealings with it. He plunged into a disastrous struggle with the Seljuk Sultan of Iconium, and he quarreled with the Emperor Henry VI, who would certainly have invaded his dominions if death had not intervened to prevent it. But as long as Alexius was permitted to enjoy the pleasures of the table in his villas on the Bosphorus, the ill success abroad of his arms and his diplomacy vexed him but little. But in 1203, a new and unexpected danger arose to scare him from his feasting. His blind brother Isaac had a young son named Alexius, who escaped from Constantinople to Italy and took refuge with Philip of Swabia, the new emperor of the West. Philip had married a daughter of Isaac Angelus and determined to do something to help his young brother-in-law. The opportunity was not hard to seek. Just at this moment, a large body of French, Flemish, and Italian crusaders, it's the fourth crusade we're talking about here, who had taken arms at the command of the Pope, were lying idle at Venice. They had marched down to the great Italian seaport with the intention of directing a blow against Malik Aldel, Sultan of Egypt. Okay, so that's the end of my reading from the Byzantine Empire by Charles W.C. Omen. And I hope it was interesting. We just covered the period between 1180, when Manuel Comnenus dies, and 1203 when the Fourth Crusade gets diverted to Constantinople. And you can see how the reigns of Isaac Angelus and Alexius Angelus coincide with the Fourth Crusade. Isaac and Alexius have this horrible government that has destroyed the Byzantine Empire. Already the empire is falling apart. Cyprus revolts. The Bulgarians finally rise up and get their revenge against uh, their defeat to Basil II so long ago. And you've got wars with the Holy Roman Emperor and the Normans and the Turks. And meanwhile, the emperors aren't able to, to deal adequately with any of this. And in fact, they are actively doing the opposite. They are indulging in pleasure. They are sitting around eating, getting fat, having a good time, collecting priceless art while the empire burns over this over these couple of decades. So um, and, and ultimately this conflict between the two of them, you know, these two idiots, the Angeli, they they finally betray each other. And then one of them has a son who, after his father is blinded and in prison, he escapes and runs off to the West and intermarries with a Western family. And, and he contracts the Fourth Crusade to go and put him back, put him on the throne of Constantinople. And the Fourth Crusade does it. They march off to Constantinople to do this. 
And you can see how the decline, the destruction of the Byzantine Empire at the hands of these idiots is really what brings about the Fourth Crusade. The Fourth Crusade would have never ended up in Constantinople if it had not been for this conflict between the Angeli and um, the absolute deplorable state of the empire and the Byzantine military's inability to defend itself or fight off. Or indeed, the, even the existence of the Byzantine mil military. It's, it's a bunch of mercenaries who don't care and are taking part in coups against it. So, you know, this idea, there, and this is not to excuse anything that happened in the Fourth Crusade, not at all. You know, the events of the Fourth Crusade are horrific. The Franks sacked Constantinople. The French and the Venetians sacked it in a brutal way. It's one of the most horrible sacks in medieval history, without question. However, this idea that there was some kind of hidden plot that the Crusaders, especially the Venetians, intended to do this is ridiculous. For one thing, the Venetians wanted Alexandria. They wanted it badly. You know why? Because Alexandria, during this period, was the wealthiest, most important damn port in that part of the world, in the Mediterranean, period. Acre was just behind it. Acre was controlled by the Crusaders. Alexandria was absolutely... If the Venetians had controlled Alexandria they would have been an empire of just incredible power. And meanwhile, at this time, the Muslims, Saladin's, um, Saladin's descendants, are in conflict with each other. So Alexandria is very vulnerable. This could have been done. This could have been done. Meanwhile, Constantinople offers absolutely nothing to the Venetians. I mean, in comparison to Alexandria. At this point, Constantinople has lost most of its trade. It is impoverished. It is constantly disturbed by civil unrest and violence. It is nothing like what it was when the First Crusaders went through it. Nothing. And it's all happened in the last few decades under these horrible emperors. So the idea, and this idea that the Venetians had some kind of secret agreement with, with um, the Egyptians, and they were going to go down there and you know di divert this whole thing to Constantinople is just so ridiculous. There's no evidence for it. And uh, historians, you know, Jonathan Phillips, Christopher Tyreman, and uh, Tom Madden have all shown it to be false. So that's what happened. That's what actually happened with the Fourth Crusade was that there was this conflict already within the Byzantine nobility, between the Ange within the Angeli, within this one family that sparked this massive civil unrest. And remember too, remember earlier, we saw... Uh, the different factions in the Byzantine nobility fighting each other. And again, they called on foreign mercenaries, didn't they, to fight for them. Conrad of Montferrand, who is famous for his involvement in the Third Crusade, he was involved, he got in, in on this. He went to Constantinople and was worked for the Byzantine emperor. So this is kind of not really a new thing, that the Byzantines, you've got a a very kind of like micro fight going on among Byzantine nobility while they're contracting all these foreigners, you know, Turks, Franks, whatever, these kind of warlike foreigners to fight this battle for them. So it's like on two levels. It's almost like in the Iliad, you've got the gods fighting and then you've got Troy and, and uh, the Achaeans fighting each other. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of almost like that. So yeah, we have to kind of look at this to understand what was happening to the Byzantine world at this time, because it's not so simple as we well, you know everything was great in the Byzantine Empire, and then all of a sudden a bunch of you know a-hole crusaders show up and destroy everything, and that's it. 1204 is the end result of decades of decay and stupidity and poor leadership, and it results in this horrible thing that happens in 1204. 
that the Crusaders who did it are responsible for it. The Venetians who did it are responsible for it. No question about that. They're responsible for their actions. But it didn't happen in a vacuum. It was the result. It was The events were set in motion by previous things that were happening within Constantinople itself. So it's very tragic. I love Byzantine history and Byzantine civilization. Absolutely love it. Just a beautiful culture, a beautiful history they have in terms of their cultural achievements and their art. But they do have a weird history. The Byzantine world, I mean, there are so many either mediocre or just rotten emperors. And then you've got a few brilliant emperors, awesome emperors, you know. But this one period we're talking about is really the, the lowest period, a period of incredible darkness. And it really lays the foundations for why the Byzantine em Empire ultimately collapsed. It's not sufficient to just say... The West was aggressive against the Byzantine world, and that's what destroyed the empire. That doesn't work. That does not work. You know, the Byzantine world had to fall apart from within first before it could really be looted and sacked and, you know, left to the, to the plunderers, you know, the Turks and the Franks who, who fought over the bones. <clears throat> and that's what happened. Um... You have this decay from within, and there comes a point when it's irreversible, or at least that's what we get from the history. You know, after the First Crusade is this incredible moment when the Byzantine Empire has this opportunity to rise again. And I'm going to say that both the West and the Byzantines really did not act in a way that was going to ultimately make those gains of the First Crusade count, you know. In the long run, that is. You know, that's the thing. We're looking at centuries, not just the immediate period. You know, for the people living at the time, you know, at the 12th century, it would have seemed like things were going pretty well for most of the 12th century. You know, you have these gains. Um, the Komneni really make these serious gains. After the First Crusade kind of like lays the foundation for that. Alexius Komnenos conquers a lot. John Komnenos conquers even more. And then Manuel has some impressive... You know, he's an impressive emperor in a lot of ways, but it didn't fully happen in that period. Anatolia was not saved. And because of that, things got bad, you know. But at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a question, too, of the people who were there. You know, the Angeli were able to come to power. They were. There was nobody there who was of the reverse type of personality who could have stopped them, or at least nobody we can see looking at history. So anyway, that's just kind of a little discussion of the period leading up to the Fourth Crusade, which is a really fascinating period in Byzantine history, and interestingly enough, one that is rarely discussed in detail. You know, everybody knows about the First Crusade. Everybody knows about the Fourth Crusade. Those kind of two big blips on the radar screen of history, you know, when people are doing high school history or whatever, those events are discussed usually, but those there's there's a lot within that happens in between those events that really counts, and especially this period we look at these two decades, you know, almost um, a little more than two decades. This uh, 1180s through 1190s into the early 1200s, this just has a crucial impact on Byzantine history. So that's what we that's what we've been talking about today. So thanks very much. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you like the videos and want to support Real Crusades History, just use the donate link in the about box. Also, like Real Crusades History on Facebook. Like us on Twitter. Thanks.